Well, one of the challenges we have is that not all of our patients have um, good insight into their illness, and sometimes when people are, feel better, uh, they don't necessarily see the need for medication. And unfortunately or fortunately, when people stop their medications, they don't always see the effect of that right away. And so they need to understand the concept of prevention or prophylaxis, and they also need to understand the consequences of relapse. And how, how would you present that to a patient in terms of thinking about the, the consequences of a relapse? Well, I think there are two kinds of consequences. One is, you know, the disruption it might have to your job or your housing or to your relationships. And that, you know, that, that can hit home pretty, pretty readily. You know, there's this other sort of biological thing that, you know, psychosis, being psychotic is bad for your brain, too. And so there, you know, there may be disease progression, if, if that's the way we think about it. But, you know, I really try to use the sort of more the motivational interviewing try to approach to say, you know, if you... You know, there are things you want to do, like work or have relationships or maintain housing, then, you know, medications are maybe one way to help you maintain those things. And the irony is that when people are lulled into a false sense of security that they're doing well, they actually have a lot to lose. Right. And sometimes it's hard for them to really uh, see that. And so it's a very, I think it's a very challenging part of the therapeutic relationship, you know, to try to instill in a, in a young person who's experiencing the onset of this illness the right kind of information and the right kind of motivation without scaring them too much because you also want them to have a sense of optimism and hope about the future. So it can be a real challenge. People um, have an acute illness model. You know, yes, absolutely. I took the medicine, I'm better, I'm done. And, uh, you know, trying to draw that link between the medicine you know, that I'm feeling better because of the medicine. You know, we think it's obvious, but it's not obvious to others. Absolutely, and you referenced the, you know, the potential changes even in, in, in brain physiology or brain function. So Jeffrey, what do you, what do you think, there's been a lot of uh, interesting discussion, data, controversies about both the effects of medication over the long term and also the effects of being psychotic on, on the brain. So how would you characterize that? I characterize it this way. Only in psychiatry would you see, have a situation where over a half a century uh, from the uh, discovery of a major advance in, in therapeutics uh, and countless number of studies demonstrating the acute and prophylactic efficacy of a class of medications, would you still have people uh, questioning the effectiveness of these medicines and uh, either overtly or, or subtly encouraging people to avoid the use of antipsychotic medications. I think that it's a, a double standard, it's wrong-minded, and it's destructive. So the specific arguments, as Scott began to describe, are you know, if you risk discontinuing medicine, even if it's done in a rational and uh, uh, deliberate way, are that you will be vulnerable to have symptoms recur. And if symptoms recur, there's immediately some disruption to your life. There's also the potential for complications such as suicide, such as violence, such as homelessness. Um, but there's also uh, the uh, possibility that there is some progression of the illness, and, and don't forget, Schizophrenia was originally identified uh, by Kreplin at the latter part of the 19th century because, not because of its symptoms, which Bloiler focused on, but because of the deterioration that individuals experienced over the course of their illness. So um, this is a characteristic of schizophrenia. It is, seems to be tied to the uh, uh, process of having psychotic episodes and then with the advent of imaging, it was associated with the um, possibility that the progression is reflected by some structural brain changes in the form of a reduction of volume of certain regions in the uh, brain, and particularly in, in the gray matter. Now, the countervailing uh, line of evidence, which um, individuals will cite as cautionary, is the studies that suggest that people who get more antipsychotic medication uh, may lose more volume in brain gray matter. And then there were some studies done in monkeys 
uh, that uh, compared placebo versus different antipsychotic drugs, which showed this atrophy in the brain. The problem that with those studies, though, these animal studies were normal monkeys. They weren't individuals that had schizophrenia. So if you were to do the unethical, impossible to do study now where you took first episode patients and you randomized them to placebo or you randomized them to treatment uh, and you took healthy controls and you just followed them, what I predict you would see is that you would see a decline in brain volume in specific regions in the untreated illness group and you would see uh, less of a decline in the treated group. Um, but uh, so this is you know, the flaw in not having definitive evidence. So in essence, although there are these different you know, uh, ways of construing the evidence, it seems to me that to not you know, use medication for fear of long-term effects is completely wrong and that the long-term benefits outweigh clearly the potential risks. And then the other thing that you were alluding to, John, <coughs> is the comorbid medical conditions with shortened longevity that uh, uh, Jury Tahonen has demonstrated in his study, um, that individuals who have greater adherence to medicine over the course of their lives uh, do tend to live longer than those that don't.